what, why, how. My Eastern Christian tradition knows the story of a well-known abbot of a very renowned monastery. And the abbot was known for walking the halls the long night through. On occasion, he would stop by a cell door and knock. And the vexed bark of a roused monk would call out, What is it? And the abbot would say, You know what it is. And he'd keep on walking. I think most people have the capacity to intuit what is what. I know Linda Jasinski does. Early in the planning of this day, she asked, do you have a title for your presentation? Uh, I quickly thought and I said, well, how about something like, um, a season for clearing. And she immediately come back. She came back, she says, oh, that is what we all need to do. And I didn't even know what I was going to say. <laughs> By the way, I'd like to thank not only Linda, but John and Kathy and the uh, campus ministry office for permitting me to address you this morning. And I do mean address. As the invitation came to me, the term was to preach the retreat. Um, I'm a little gun shy at being requested to preach. What comes to mind is uh, Flannery O'Connor's supposed response when asked why she attended daily mass. And she purportedly said, the preaching is so atrocious, those people must be attending for some reason, and I want to find out what that is. <laughs> Let me be a little bit more detailed and explicit about the content of our time together here this morning. The intent is to explore, within the purview of the Christian tradition, the geography of our inner self for the purpose of taking care of it, proper care. Especially that precious parcel of the spiritual self that relates to the ground in which a seed is choked by thorny overgrowth in the parable of the sower and the types of soils. Let us now listen to that gospel and then proceed. And when a great multitude had gathered, and they had come to him from every city, he spoke by a parable. A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and it was trampled down, and the birds of the air devoured it. Some fell on rock, and as soon as it sprang up, it withered away because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it and choked it. But others fell on good ground, sprang up, and yielded a crop a hundredfold. When he had said these things, he cried, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. 
Then his disciples asked him, saying, What does this parable mean? And he said, To you it has been given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the meaning of the parable is this. The seed is the word of God. Those by the wayside are the ones who hear. Then the devil comes and takes away the word out of their hearts, lest they should believe and be saved. But the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. But they have no root. They believe for a while, and in time of temptation fall away. Now the ones that fell among thorns are those who, when they have heard, go out and are choked with the cares, riches, and pleasures of life, and bring no fruit to maturity. But the ones that fell on the good ground are those who, having heard the word with a noble and good heart, keep it and bear fruit with patience. And my, how our lives have become cluttered by the thick undergrowth of distraction and concern that chokes and drains us. Just as a landowner clears a pasture to support the desired types of plant life and animal life, so shall we clear our spiritual terrain. Thus, talk today will be of clearing, of decluttering, simplifying, quieting down, focusing, eliminating superfluous distractions that needlessly claim our attention, our time, our energy. And not only our time and energy, but the resurrection peace and joy and freedom of spirit that the Lord means us to have in Him and Him alone. This presentation does have a thesis. Uh, academics are trained to deal with theses. Simply put, it would be this. Uh, the same strategies that are recommended for the clearing of our external living and working spaces, these strategies may be applied to our inmost spiritual space as well. The controlling image in mind through the composition of this address was Walt Disney's Snow White, in which the uh, dwarves pick up their digging tools and head down into their mine to extract the treasures there, singing hi-ho, hi-ho. I remember in kidhood, I sort of related to Sleepy as a kind of patron saint of mine. <laughs> But the idea here is to pick up our land clearing in implements, to head down to the field of our inner selves. Again, what, why, and how? Another what to address are, are my sources, main sources. Uh, that I would like to introduce and leave them for you to look at um, maybe during your lunch time. Um, the first is a book by Sarah Parsons. Lent is a time for repentance and confession, and I confess that I stole her title. 
Hers is a clearing season, reflections for Lent. Orthodox Bishop Callisto Ware, since we're going inward, I recommend the inner kingdom, a collection of his talks and presentations. And finally, the, and these are all inexpensive, I think they're all under $18, Amazon.com. Finally is the Philokalia, the Eastern Christian spiritual texts, a collection of texts from the fourth to the 15th centuries, but recommends this particular publication is that the texts are arranged according to themes, repentance, the heart, prayer, the passions, stillness. What, why, how, another preliminary what. In the publication and the spreading of the word, the seed for this particular morning, the flyer had the picture of a particular icon on the top. The title of that icon is called Christ the Bridegroom. The term bridegroom is a title that Christ applied to himself. And in the Eastern tradition, on Palm Sunday night, parishioners gather for what is called the bridegroom service. And during that service, the priest processes in and places at the front of the church the icon of Christ the bridegroom. And for the next three days, from Monday morning to today, Holy Thursday, these are given over to the contemplation of Christ as the central figure in the parable of the ten virgins. A hymn from that prayer service reads thusly. Behold, the bridegroom comes in the middle of the night, and blessed is the servant he shall find vigilant but unworthy is the one whom he shall find neglectful. Beware therefore, O my soul, lest you be weighed down by sleep, lest you be given over to death and be closed out from the kingdom. I'd like to have you listen to the musical setting of that particular bridegroom prayer service him, if you would. Thank you, Linda. The bridegroom is depicted at the moment of his passion, wearing the crown of thorns, holding the mock scepter reed, his hands bound the rope symbolizing sin and death and corruption, which will be loosed 
through his death and resurrection. A bit later in that same service, the following is chanted. I behold the fully adorned bridal chamber, O my Savior, but I do not have an appropriate garment with which to enter. Illumine the garment of my soul, O giver of light, and save me. The tone there is very, very solemn because it is sung in realization that the Savior's bridal chamber and his tomb are one and the same. It's okay. One last what relates directly to the why question. Today we begin to clear our lives. Why? at least, at the very least, so that we can contemplatively focus on the passion and death of Christ tomorrow. What? Why? And the final question. The famous Victorian Thomas Carlyle, when he was a lad, came home one Sunday afternoon in a very dyspeptic, sour mood, and he just sat at the brunch table, and his mother observed him not eating, but just pushing his, what, um, eggs and fish around. And so finally she said, Thomas, what is it? The young man said, Mama, oh, why do sermons have to be so long? If I was the minister, I would just ascend the pulpit, look over the people and say, my dear people, you know what you should do. Just go out and do it. The mother said, I, Thomas, but would you not be telling them how? We're going to concentrate after we do the little bit of the theology and the, and the theory, uh, concentrate on the hows, the practicalities of how to clear our inner selves. So part one, the strategy. Clearing can refer to our material living and workspaces and our spiritual lives. There's no shortage of space on the internet or bookshelves on how to clear your surrounding spaces. It seems like every era, every epoch, knows its own need for some sort of living simply moment or movement. In the late 19th century, in reaction to the Industrial Revolution, members of what came to be known as the arts and crafts movement feared that industrialization was leading to the extinction of traditional skills. Movement members believed that handcrafted objects were superior to those made by machine and that rural craftspersons enjoyed a superior quality of life compared to those who slaved away in the urban mills and factories. They were convinced that the general loss of pastoral simplicity and personal care for one's surroundings was linked to the nation's social and moral decline. Another influential Victorian, William Morris, was a leading spokesperson for this movement. And his first and greatest commandment was thus, have nothing about you that you do not know to be useful or believe to be beautiful. In the past few years, there's been a significant media attention to a movement that styles itself as the simple living or minimalist movement. 
And perhaps you're familiar with its main ideals. For example, being anti-conspicuous consumption, having respect for the environment, being beneficially self-sufficient, being pro-sustainable development, and of course, living a streamlined, simplified lifestyle. Less is more is a prime watchword. And as with the earlier arts and crafts movement, part of that more is being more appreciative of the wisdom of the arts. A sculptor, for instance, approaches a large block of marble and through the process of elimination releases that beautiful statue inside the block to come out. A commissioned master potter thinks only of what kind of pleasing and useful empty space he or she can create for his or her client. Hans Hoffmann, the German-born American abstract expressionist painter, asserted this. The ability to simplify means to eliminate the unnecessary so that the necessary may communicate itself. Let me repeat that. The ability to simplify means to eliminate the unnecessary so that the necessary may communicate itself. He was speaking about his philosophy of painting composition, but does not that have immediate application to our spiritual lives as well? All music conductors work from the same score. Being raised in Cleveland, I was treated to hearing George Sell conduct the renowned Cleveland Orchestra. A master musician was asked what made Zell, what constituted his genius as a conductor? And the respondent said, what makes him great is that he knows how to play the pauses. Those intervals where there is no sound whatsoever. How do we play our pauses in life? I think is a question well worth pondering. Uncluttered living spaces and workspaces are touted to be less stressful, more efficient. Simple living is also more economical, not only in terms of budget line items, but in terms of invested time and the expenditure of energy. Simplicity frees us up for more space, for receiving and nurturing those things that are to be appreciated as, as natural good gifts of human existence. Going inexpensive and simple does not necessitate sacrificing one's individuality or unique creative genius. This is just from the most recent uh, Home and Design page of the Inquirer. It's, uh, the title is From Ikea to Imea, um, something called Ikea hacking, where you um, customize, you know, their wares for your own spaces, according to your own tastes. Just to read a um, paragraph. And it has become an international phenomenon. Mei Mei Yap, a copyright artist from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia, is among the chief cultivators of this practice. She runs the blog ikeahackers.net, which features projects as simple as transforming a stainless steel slotted spoon into a soap dish, or a complex curving bathroom wall 
made entirely with rectangle vexes. At quick glance, many simple living websites and published books, it seems to me, offer just, when you get right down to it, variations of the same basic three-step strategy for decluttering your life. First, you select out what you really need from what you want and what you have. And secondly, you eliminate all that that is unnecessary, that is excessive. And thirdly, you organize what you have kept. Systematically, this is done by going through each room of the house, one room at a time, selecting, eliminating, organizing, and then out to the garage, and then around the garden, and in your yard in general. If I were to write a book on uh, simple living, I would suggest starting with the medicine cabinet. There's all sorts of stuff in there usually that's either out of date or never worked in the first place when first applied or ingested. Part two, towards awareness of the outer and inner self. A psychological question, not theological, but psychologically this is posed. What constitutes the value of our personhood as a human being, as distinct from all other kinds of being? Granting some amounts of self-awareness to porpoises and to even to polywogs, and maybe even to plant life, as some suppose, I'm open to that. The degree to which we can be self-aware, aware of oneself, certainly sets human existence apart from other levels of creaturely existence. As humans, we have the ability to construct a sentence. I feel blank about my self. The beginning of the sentence, there's an I. As distinct from what's at the end of the sentence, a self. And we can think about ourself, we can feel about ourself, we can relate to ourself in many, many different ways. Is this not true? For example, I can be proud of myself or ashamed of myself. I can respect myself or not. I can take good care of myself or not. At times I disappoint myself. And other times I feel justified in congratulating myself. One can be at peace with oneself. You can discipline yourself. You can spoil yourself. You can scare yourself. You can make a promise to yourself and even break it. When was the last time you surprised yourself? I hope it was a good occasion. They're not always good surprises, but I hope yours was. In some situations, we handle ourselves very well. In other situations, we are apt to embarrass ourselves. Aristotle spoke well in teaching that the key to a full and authentic human existence is to know ourselves. In what way does the Bible suggests that we see ourselves, both in our physical outwardness and our spiritual inwardness. 
The book of Genesis endows the view of ourself in our outwardness as a geomorph, a earth form. We were formed by the hand of God out of ground stuff and into ground stuff, so we shall return. The word, the English words human and humus are very much related. In the Hebrew, the words are Adam, meaning just human. It's not a personal name. And Adam is made out of Adama, which means soil, which means earth. Genesis 2, 7 supports the understanding that we are earthlings made out of the earth. My dear colleague, uh, Dr. Judith Hadley in our department, our biblical, one of our biblical scholars, reminds her students that Adam is not a proper name. Uh, and so she invites her students to suggest appropriate names for this first human. And then uh, after receiving some nominations, she sort of trumps them all by suggesting that the most proper name for the first human would be Dusty. <laughs> our bodiliness is a geomorph. Our innermost being has a geography all its own. Inspired scripture authors and subsequent theologians and spiritual masters have waxed poetically about the nature and function of our inmost mapped out spiritual geography. Let us consider, for example, Thomas Merton, author of my favorite work of his, Conjectures of a Guilty Bystander. Guilty bystander. Now, here was a person who knew what was what about his own self. In his work, he discerns and describes a very special place within the soul. And I'd like to read that paragraph to you. At the center of our being is a point of nothingness which is untouched by sin and by illusion, a point of pure truth a point or spark which belongs entirely to God, which is never at our disposal, from which God disposes of our lives, which is inacceptable to the fantasies of our mind or the brutalities of our will. This little point of nothingness and of absolute poverty is the pure glory of God within us. It is like a pure diamond blazing with the invisible light of heaven. It is in everyone. And if we could see it, we would see these billion points of light coming together in the face and blaze of a sun that would make all the darkness and cruelty of life vanish completely. Merton does not designate this very special center of our soul with the word heart, but his discernment resonates perfectly with the biblical metaphor of heart as that hidden, inaccessible, and mysterious depth of something or someone. Among the more than 800 biblical applications of lev or, or heart and its cognates, one finds reference to the heart of the sea to indicate the very deepest depth of the ocean or the heart of heaven to indicate its unattainable heights. As applied to human beings, it indicates the inner reality of someone as distinct 
from the superficial appearances of our geomorphic self. Psalm 64, the heart is deep. Bishop Callistos Ware reminds, in Isaiah, God complains of the Israelites that they, quote, draw near to me with their mouth and with their lips they do honor me, but they have removed their heart far from me. His complaint is not precisely that the Israelites are hypocrites, for it is quite likely they believe that they are serving him as they ought. It is rather that, despite their words and their conscious thoughts, they are far removed from him in the deepest wellspring of their being. Biblical heart connotes holistic integrity. When in Jeremiah, God promises the Israelites, I will give them a heart to know me, the meaning is least about rational knowledge about. Rather, Jeremiah is prophesying, prophesying a rightly ordered mind, consciousness, memory, conscience, intuition, will, affect. In fact, the Bible draws little distinction among these different functions of the heart. Just as a sidebar, uh, the Hebrews and Native Americans uh, have a lot in common, I've learned. Carl Jung, in his book, Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, recalls a conversation he had with an American Indian, one Ochwe Biano, an elder of the Taos Pueblo in New Mexico. Ochwe Biano said, how cruel the whites seem to be. Their lips are thin, their noses sharp, their faces furrowed and distorted. Their eyes have a staring expression. They're always seeking something. What are they seeking? The whites want something. They are always uneasy and restless. We do not know what they want. We do not understand them. We think they are mad. Not living at that, Young asked him why he thought white people were mad. And Ochoa said, they tell us they think with their heads. Why, of course, what do you think with, Young said. And Ochoa says, we think here indicating the heart. Turning to the New Testament, after the birth of Jesus, accompanied as it was by the appearance of a multitude of the heavenly host, Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. According to the fourth century writer known as Macarius, these heavenly hosts with their powers are naturalized citizens of the human heart. Quote, the heart is Christ's palace. There is God. There are the angels. There are life and the kingdom. There are light and the apostles. The heavenly cities and the treasures of grace. All things are there. In this spiritual literature, our inmost self, the heart of our soul, is the meeting place of the spiritual and the physical, of the divine and the human, of the uncreated and the created. It's the wedding chamber of our soul and God's grace. More to the point of the theme of our morning together here, let us raise up Matthew 13, 44. 
Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field which a man found and hid. And for joy over it goes and sells all that he has to purchase that field. The aforementioned Makarios picks up on the idea of the kingdom within the field and writes of this field or the pasture of the soul as having a soil which we must work with free deliberation and concerted effort. All the while, of course, recognizing that without grace, our labors are in vain. So, hi-ho, hi-ho, it's off to work we go. You may think of a wheelbarrow full of garden tools designed for clearing. What comes to your mind? Size, sickles, digging forks, pruning shears, trowels, soil scoops, rakes. But before the digging begins, let me pull a, a, a page from a clearing season, uh, Sarah Parsons' suggestion that we don't immediately jump into work, but rather contemplate our space, our inner pasture. So in a little, just a few minute guided meditation, would you please invest yourself? Breathe deeply and relax. Identify the thoughts that enter your consciousness. Especially notice your fears and worries or anything that feels overwhelming or chaotic. You may experience a feeling of being overworked of having no time for rest. You may become aware of anxiety about relationships, a feeling that your interactions with others are somehow out of balance. Don't worry about clearing this space just yet. Observe any tendency to judge yourself harshly about the nature of your pasture. And for now, just note a few of the places where you feel out of control, overwhelmed, or blocked. For now, just observe.
Part three, a how exercise in selection. Now that you are in your inner pasture, consciously establish a vigilant guarded perimeter, a selective screen or filter around your inner space. And with it, be constantly conscious and selective about what you look at, what you read, what you listen to, what you ingest. Here we can capitalize on Habakkuk 2.1. I will stand on my guard post and station myself upon the ramparts. I will keep watch to see what he will speak to me. And Isaiah 62.2. I have posted a watchman on the walls, O Jerusalem. Call upon the Lord. Demons are looking to invade your pasture with, and transform it into a battleground. A battleground of conflicting images, thoughts, and passions. Brought on by eter internalizing all of that outside noisy, flashy input. A life example that I hear all too often about, and applies mostly, I hear these stories from men. I think it's a, a very serious area in our lives in which we let our guard down. Um, a, and it has to do with becoming addicted to internet porn. We all, at times, just in surfing, come across you know, pornographic images. But I hear all too often of men who, yeah, they see it and then go on and, and they go back to it. And then go back to it again and linger further. And they end up you know, weeping on my shoulders, having lost their health, their family, their job. being selective about what we take into ourselves. My father, when he was growing up, to, tells of his dad uh, how his dad marked the first day of Lent. He very solemnly went to the radio and took, off, took out the main tube. And that was the signal that the house would be more quiet, that the shopping list would be reduced to the barest necessities, that outside entertainments were to be suspended, an atmosphere conducive to prayerful focus would reign throughout the house. A kind of vigilance, protectiveness, allows us to be able to take care of our inner selves without the encroachment of you know, things that would just complicate our clearing even as we clear. So the first recommendation, being very selective about what you see, about what you read, about what you hear, about what you say, about what you imagine. Number four, a how of elimination after selection comes the elimination. I mentioned some hand tools before. This particular suggestion is a backhoe. You know, this is the backhoe uh, for taking care of one's inner space. It is to identify and eliminate our false gods. In my own classes, in the first year course, 
I challenged my students. I said, uh, picture yourself at a party. That's not the challenging part for them. <laughs> and picture yourself over the uh, <clears throat> punch bowl and someone approaches you and says, hey, I hear you're a Christian. Would you please summarize in one word everything that Jesus was about? Everything that he lived for, died for, preached about, prayed about, and taught. What word would you have to share? And I take their suggestions, good suggestions at all. For example, love. And I say, yes, that's part of it, but the answer is bigger than love. It includes love, but bigger. Peace. Yes, yes, Jesus was all about peace, but the answer takes in peace and love. Happiness, or even better, joy, which sustains us even in our unhappy times, even when we're grieving. Yes, joy, peace, love, joy. Freedom, yes, freedom, uh, but it's this term is even bigger than that. And finally, they just get frustrated and I have to put them out of their misery. And so I say, um, it was right there on your tip of your tongues all the while long. The answer is the one word that summarizes everything that Jesus had to live for, die for, preach about, teach about, pray about, is the term Malkuta. Oh, yeah, no, no, that's not what they say. <laughs> that needs translation. Malkuta is kingdom, the kingdom of God. And I invite them to prove this for themselves. They don't have to take my word for it. Just pick up the Bible, the, the Gospels. From Matthew alone, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom. This is how you should pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Twelve twenty-eight. I drive out demons by the Spirit of God to show that the kingdom is upon you. The kingdom is like a mustard seed. The kingdom is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He will put the sheep at the right hand and the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you are blessed by my father. Take your inheritance. The kingdom has been prepared for you since the creation of the world. And then, of course, from John, my kingdom is not of this world. How to understand this kingdom? I like very much the translation of kingdom as the reign of God. God exercising God's power and authority. And wherever God exercises his power and authority, everything that we want most for ourselves and for our loved ones becomes realized. Joy, love, peace, freedom, forgiveness. The trouble is, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, that power of the kingdom that belongs to the one and only Lord, we all too often Grant that power to the false gods in our lives. People, situations that we allow, yes, we allow to rob us of the joy and the peace and the life and the freedom that God wants us to have. In our moments of reflection, you'll be invited to identify the false gods in your life, 
the ones, those situations, those persons that you have allowed to hurt you. Unnecessarily though, unnecessarily. So the invitation this morning is to reclaim Christ as the one and only Lord and power of your life. Nobody else, not your spouse, not your children, not your boss, of course, not your teachers. The whole Christian project is that we should all have the one Lord as the power and authority and life. In doing so, we'd be free. Can you imagine yourself, instead of having road rage, being able to say, goodbye, Mr. Bad Driver. Um, you're not the Lord and Savior of my life. I have a Lord and Savior, thank you. Goodbye, go on your way. Every, some, every year, somewhere in some campus, university campus, you hear the story of someone taking their life because they didn't get into that sorority or that fraternity or make that team most recently in the news. In the Western Church, in the Roman Rite, um, the book of Job is read, I understand, during the eighth and ninth weeks of ordinary time. But in our Eastern Church, the book of Job is read during Holy Week. It's a reminder and it's be made available. It's already there. If you need to revisit as a reminder, the, it's the last parts of Job where God reminds Job who is the Lord, who is the Savior, who is the power in life. Number five, um, organization or structuring. Our guide here will be Abba Antony, St. Antony the Great of Egypt, who was asked, Holy Father, what must I do in order to be saved? And his response was this, and I offer it as a way of organizing what we do have. If you keep these guidelines, you will be saved. And the guidelines are threefold. First, wherever you happen to be, stay there. And do not be quick to rush away. Sort of like a mini vow of stability. Number two, keep the commandments while you're there. And thirdly, remember God. Keep these guidelines and you will be saved. A comment on the first recommendation. Wherever you happen to be, stay there. Don't be in a hurry to go someplace else. Um, I see this very much in tune with the oriental wisdom of, of the practice of mindfulness, of awareness. God is everywhere present, but we are not. As our geomorphs are you know, occupying some space, a lot of times our heart is far away. I know, uh, listening to Father Thomas Hopko, who was the dean for, law, for many years at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary, he was just consumed by his work as dean. And being a married priest, um, he picked up vibrations from his home life that maybe he was too invested in his work, so he made a vow to himself you know, to, to spend more time 
in the home. After a few weeks, his wife said, Oh, Thomas, even when you're home, you're not at home. When we're home, let's be at home. When we're at work, let's be at work. When we're at play, let's be at play. The demon, the de demonic, that word comes from the term to bifurcate, to split apart. Our pastures are populated by demons tempting us to multitask our numerous reasons to stress out, to worry, to fear, which takes us out of the presence of the presence of God and usually puts us someplace in the past or in the future. leaving the demon jackals to cackle because the past is no more and the future doesn't exist yet. Second, to keep the commandments. Simply, and what are the greatest of commandments? Matthew 22. And one of them, a scholar of the law, tested Jesus by asking, teacher, which commandment is the, of, in the law is the greatest? And Jesus said, to just edit a little bit for our day, you shall love the Lord your God with your whole self. And the second is just like it. You shall love others as you love yourself. And thirdly, after being someplace, staying there, keeping the commandment there, remember God. Back in our, what would be my old country, um, Eastern Europe, in the old country of my family, the elderly, when they see someone with no peace, no joy, no freedom, no love, and they end up hurting themselves or hurting other people, they would just bless themselves and say, they have forgotten God, they have forgotten God. And so remember, who is present when you are fully present in yourself with some person or in some situation? And lastly, the last point. Suppose, despite all your vigilance, despite trying to keep your inner past, your clear, of undesirable growth and attacking demons. Suppose you find this a losing battle. I leave you with this little story. A man took pride, a great pride in his lawn and found himself with a large crop of dandelions. He tried every method he knew to get rid of them and they still plagued him. Finally, he wrote the Department of Agriculture. He enumerated all the things he had tried and closed his letter with the question, what shall I do now? In due course came the reply, we suggest that you learn to love them. Thank you. Thank you.